My name is Eric Valchak. Uh, I'm a PhD student at University College London, and I, I research speech processing in the brain. So I'll, I'll give you a brief, brief overview of neuroscience of multilingualism, what it is, how it, how it um, researches topic that we're all interested in, um, that is uh, speaking several languages, learning languages. So I'll start with a brief outline. So the first part will be definitions and difficulties facing research on multilingualism. So in order to fully understand the topic, it, it is important to define the, the terms that will be used because they, that can change the way we understand a certain phenomenon. The next part will be neuroscience and brain changes. So what is neuroscience and how brain changes? What's happening in the brain? Next part will be difficulties in language learning. Uh, so wh what are difficulties in, in learning languages? S sorry, one disappeared. That's probably because of, of the Mac. Um, and the last part will be effects of multilingualism. So what are the effects of speaking several languages? So I'll start with language, because when we talk about polyglots or multilingualism, it is important to know what, what is a language, because there are different ways to understand a language. So I'll we can think about language as a specific instance, for example, Italian or Russian or English, but language in general is a complex system of communication. That is, that is probably the most complex human faculty. And um, an other animals have also systems of co animals have systems of communications, but human language is the most complicated um, system that we know. So language comes in different modalities, and the most common modality is speech. So uh, most of most of human languages come come in spoken form. However, they later on became transform uh, transformed into into a written form as well. So a lot of languages are written as well, and some of them some of languages are even signed, like British Sign Language or American Sign Language. So we can think about language um, in in many ways. That's something to bear in mind. And each language comes uh, with many components. That that again makes the that makes the whole task of understanding language much more complicated because when you think about language, you can you can um, you can always think about these different components like phonology, syntax, semantics, morphology, or pragmatics, and different branches of linguistics that deal with certain parts of language. So phonology dealing with sounds and how they and how they combine. So that each of these components becomes even more complicated when you think about multilinguals, because you, then you can mix different systems of phonology from, from different languages. So for example, for me, sounds like j, sh, ch, and j are, are clearly different, because I'm a na native Polish speaker. However, for someone who, who doesn't know these sounds, th they might sound exactly the same. And uh, syntax, that is grammar, how grammar is used, again, will differ between the languages. So some structures might be particular to one language, whereas they, they can be very strange or do not occur in another language. Semantics, so how, how word, um, what do they mean? So some words can actually sound the same in, in different languages, but they can have different meanings. So, so that complicates, again, the study of multilinguals. And morphology, how, wor how words are formed. So again, words can be formed in different ways, in different manners, in, in various languages. And pragmatics, the usage. So when you learn another language, you can't literally translate certain phrases because they won't make sense in other in other languages. So so these are all all parts of language that that add to the complexity, especially in multilinguals when you deal with several languages. So again, when you talk about learners of languages, we have to think: what does it mean to know a language? That that's that's probably one of the key points here to make because you can you can hear people saying that they know several languages but but what does it actually mean to know a language so some might say that means passing for a native speaker however it is very difficult if if you especially if you increase the number of languages that that the person knows so uh, it, and it becomes almost impossible if you increase the the, the number of of languages because of different um, limitations others might say that knowing a language means being able to communicate but again, what does it mean? Just order it, ordering a taco or, or, or renting a flat or, or whatever. And again, language, knowing a language can be domain specific. So for example, a person can use one language in, in one domain. For example, I use English 
Uh, I, I use English mostly for science. However, in my family setting, I, I speak Polish. So th these are all the things that we have to bear in mind um, when, when talking about multilinguals. So again, another definition is who is a polyglot, right? That, that's something we, I think we should define again. Uh, probably the most famous, well, one of the most famous polyglots uh, where Giuseppe, well, was Giuseppe Mezzofanti, who lived in uh, late 18th century and 19th century, who claimed to, to speak between 38, 80 languages. However, these claims are very difficult to verify because he was a historical figure, so we, we can't really tell how well he knew languages. Um, other person who, who was famous for his linguistic skills was Emil Krebs, who, again, who worked as, a, as an interpreter in China for many years and, and um, also could speak many languages, but, but exactly how well he knew them and what was his fluency level, it is impossible to establish. But polyglots are not just um, these mythical creatures that lived a long time ago, uh, because they are around here. Um, and uh, a lot of polyglots make actually their, their skills make public. So they, they record videos, put them online to, to inspire other learners, to show that it's possible to, to know a language and to speak many languages. So one, one of such uh, people is uh, Professor Agwe, who declines to say how many languages he, he, he knows, probably because of the previous difficulties I just mentioned. And others are Richard and Luca, who are hopefully with us here today, are they? Hello, Richard. So uh, people like that who actually we can meet and we can actually see that it, it is possible to speak several languages. And uh, we can see that, that difficulties that, that are actually facing, they are facing, uh, well, we all f face if we learn other languages. So. Again, to define a polyglot, we must know how many languages we must know, right? So, again, it's a it's a tricky question because when you look into general dictionaries, you can just hear you can just find a definition that says speaking and writing several languages. But what does it what does it mean several languages? It, does it mean three languages, five, seven? It's hard to say. Um, usually, the term polyglots is not used that often in in scientific literature, and that's that's what I'm going to to talk about about. Uh, science and how it understands the topic of, of successful language learners. So you can often find terms like bilinguals, bilingualism or multilingualism. And um, bilingualism is, uh, again, is not that, is defined in many ways. So one of the most common definitions actually says that bilinguals is use more than one language. So not what you might instinctively, instinctively think as using two languages. However, when I will, when I will use the, these terms, I'll use bilingualism to mean someone knowing two languages and multilingualism knowing more than two languages. And the frequency of these terms varies. Again, I, I run a, sh sh uh, a quick Ngram viewer search, so you can see that the number of occurrences of certain words in, in books in Google's library. So bilingual is much more common than multilingualism and, and polyglot might be due, due to the relative frequency of, of this phenomena. However, it's, it's hard to say. But, but polyglot, polyglot is still a bit of a strange word for a lot of people who are not um, interested in that, who, who are not polyglots themselves. So again, when we, when we think about multilingualism or bilingualism, um, there are different types to, to complicate the, the issue a bit more. So we can think about early and late bilinguals or multilinguals, so people who learn languages in different stages of their life. Usually the, the difference between early and late is so-called critical period. So the, so the time when, when humans are more likely to achieve very high level of language fluency. However, it's a contentious issue. Um, another distinction is, is uh, whether someone is a simultaneous or successive by a multilingual. Again, it might be difficult, especially when, when you talk about multilinguals, because sometimes you can't really say that that's one person study languages at the same time or one after another, especially if you, if you multiply the number of languages, because then it can uh, become both sometimes. Um, another category is folk and elite, so that's more sociological category, which actually puts more uh, focus on prestige and status of certain languages. So certain languages can be discouraged, actually. So folk languages are often considered, um, let's say, inferior, unfortunately, 
like minority languages or languages of immigrant communities, which cannot, uh, can often be not that actively taught at schools. And elite bilingualism or multilingualism often involve languages, say world languages, um, languages that are widely spoken. So again, you can see that there are different ways of understanding this particular phenomenon. So that was the introduction, uh, the definition. So I can, so hopefully you can understand now that that all these types of definitions, all all ways of understanding these terms, make the the study of multilinguals very difficult for scientists because there are many ways to underst to understand to look at these phenomena, and um, the, the another complexity to, to add to these ways to, of understanding languages, so different definitions, again, are dif differences and interactions between different languages. So here you can see a family tree of languages. So languages, long time ago, started as some uh, proto-language, and then the languages started to branch out into different languages, so divide into different types, and gradually they became more separated from from another. So nowadays you can you can think about languages that are similar to each other, like Italian or Spanish, and uh, others which are not so close to each other, like say Mandarin Chinese and Spanish. And again, depending on the set of languages that the person knows, the the processing of these languages will will be different. And again, that makes comparison between the people much more difficult. So so that is why there are not that many studies um, studying multilinguals, because ideally you would have a group of people that are as similar as possible. However, because of the, the complexity of these issues I've mentioned, it is, it is quite complicated to find a group of people that who know the same set of languages or learn them at the same time or know them to the same level. So why should we study brains? Wh what's interesting ab about brains? So brain is a, is a control center for language. So that's where, where language is processed. So that brain is an organ that controls language understanding, language production. And, and in order to understand language, it actually it is important to have a look at the brain, at the center. Wh what's going on over there? So studying brains allows understanding of the processes that, that control the language, actually looking into the underlying causes, let's say. However, brain is enormously complex. So brain is the most complex organ, uh, let's say, in the known universe. Com com <coughs> and it's built of 86 billion neurons, uh, neural, neural nerve cells, and many more connections between them. So that can show you the, well, how, why it is difficult and, and why we still are not clearly uh, sure what is going on in the brain. So the study that studies brain is called neuroscience. So it's an interdisciplinary science that combines chemistry, biology, psychology, linguistics, um, in artificial intelligence, computer science, and, and many other disciplines. And neuroscience uses a set of methods that are specific to, to well, not only specific to neuroscience, but that can answer the questions about brain. And these methods var vary on their temporal resolution. So this is that axis. So um, how much we can we can tell about the time of certain of certain events. Uh, the methods vary on spatial resolution. So how much can we tell about the location of a certain action or a certain structure and invasiveness? So how much um, say changes do we have to introduce into into the brain? So I'll give you examples of each of these types of methods. So for example, when you think about temporal resolution, so we can think about um, methods like electroencephalography that measures electrical activity of the brain that can give you answers um, about, about brain's activity. So what's going on in the brain up to one millisecond, um, up to one millisecond after a certain stimulus was presented. On the other hand, we can think about certain injuries, so-called lesions, where you can see the effects of, for example, strokes, sometimes days or weeks after the occurrence of a certain um, accident. And again, when you think about 
spatial resolution. You can, you can look at single neurons, so they are very tiny nerve cells. On the other hand, you can observe whole brain when you scan brain with magnetic resonance, and then you can see the whole structure. So that shows you different ways, different levels of understanding brain. And um, usually you can't, have, you can't have it all. So in most cases you can focus either on temporal resolution or spatial resolution. It's very difficult to have both. So know what precisely is going on, at what time, and uh, wh wh what's, what's going on precisely. So we have to limit ins itself. Scientists must limit themselves. And another case, again, is invasiveness. So whether we have to... Uh, manipulate brains. So for example, some scientists would inject drugs into brains to see what's going on. Others would just scan the brain activity to, to see what actually is happening on, on the surface. And neuroscience deals with brain mapping. So in order to understand brain, we need to create some kind of map of brains. So wha what is going on in the brain? And there are two different types of brain mapping, structural and functional. So when you think about structure, we want to understand brain in terms of its shape and its size. So to understand how each part of brain uh, looks. And in order to do that, we use several uh, techniques. So one of them is magnetic resonance, which shows you the, the inside of, of the scalp and it can show you the shape of, of different structures. And, and when you go deeper to, say, single cells, you can use technique like Brainbow, which shows you single neurons, single nerve cells, and and what what they are doing. Again, brain mapping can be understanding in terms of function. So, what is activated in the brain doing certain actions? So, one of the techniques that that are used here is electroencephalography, which measures electrical activity of the brain and can tell you what is um, going on at what is activated during certain tasks. So, per, for example brain can react in certain way when wh when hears words that are not um, correct for example wh when when you hear a word that is not expected for example um, you use different tense that you should use for example yesterday I go to school then most cases your brain will react in a, in a specific way because they can uh, brains can notice this um, incongruency this error Another way to study function, functional imaging is study blood oxygenation activity. So um, where, where is blood uh, moving around the brain and, and how it is oxygenated? And based on that, scientists try to answer the questions about which areas are involved into s in, in certain functions. So that leads, uh, leads us to a question, do multilinguals have different brains from, from monolinguals? And the short answer is, is yes. But uh, it is not surprising because any, any cognitive skill, any motor skill, changes brain structure and function as well. So, for example, taxi drivers who have different brains from people who do not drive regularly because the act of navigating around the city changes the actual structure of, of brain of, of, of uh, taxi drivers. And the same thing happens when you, when you use your brain for, for certain skill, like um, changing between languages, using languages translation. So, so that is not surprising. But again, in order to understand what, what is special about brains of multilinguals or, or monolinguals, we need to go a bit deeper. So one of the studies that, um, that, that I particularly like involved um, Emil Krebs, that, uh, that was previously mentioned, who uh, was a fa famous Germ German polyglot. And Emil Krebs died in 1930. And he had this outstand outstanding language competence, which made uh, someone store his brain in the jar for 74 years. Um, and, and what happened in, in 2004 is that a group of German neuroscientists actually decided to slice Krebs' brain and see how, how, it, how it looks under the microscope. So is it different from brains of monolinguals? Um, and wh where are these differences located? So in order to do that, the scientists focus on two particular ar areas. So these are so-called Broadman Area 44 and Broadman Area 45. And there, when combined, they are called Broca's area. So that's a classic language uh, brain area, uh, which is responsible for, for speech production. And 
what the scientists did is they they extracted um, these slices of brain and and then um, analyzed them. And what was interesting about Krebs' brain, Krebs uh, Krebs uh, scores are shown with the stars, and as you can see here, uh, here are the monolinguals, so people who, who couldn't speak um, more than one language and uh, were used as controls to compare the brains between Emil Krebs and people who who can't speak that many languages. And what was found is that Krebs brain structure actually differed in, in structure. So the density of, um, of neurons was higher in Krebs brain in, in these three, well, in these three parts of brain. So Broca, um, Broadman's area 44 and four on left and right hand side. So that's, that's Broadman's area 44 on both sides. And in Broadman's area 45, in the right hemisphere, but but again, what does it mean? We, we can't really tell based on that whether whether Krebs' brain was different because he was a polyglot, or whether he was a polyglot because his brain was different. So we, we can't really distinguish based on this study w w the, the causal effect. So um, again, in order to to answer this question, what what's needed is a is a study on on training to see how brain changes. Um, scientists use term plasticity so so plasticity is is a study of how the entire brain structure changes yep oh the that's the density brain of of neurons so so let's say it was like more packed let's say in one part of the brain brains um had more of nerve cells so let's say it, but again it was hard to say whether that was the cause or, or the effect so to set to to answer this question, what is needed is a training study where where actually scientists have to, well, see what happens to the brain before a certain period of training and after a period of training, and and the idea that that brain changes is called plasticity, and and in this particular study by by Schlegel and colleagues, uh, they studied the plasticity of of white matter, which is which is this part of the brain, again, the consisting. Of uh, well, that that takes the most part of 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 the brain, let's say. And um, what was found in this particular study on um, language learners was that uh, again, brain changed after a function of uh, after a period of studying foreign language. So this particular scientist uh, scanned the brains of monolingual English native speakers who studied Mandarin for nine months. And um, brains of, of this group of people, of students of Mandarin, were scanned and compared to a group of people who did not study Mandarin for, for that time. And what was found is that the, the brains actually changed. <coughs> the brains of, of students who studied Mandarin changed after this period of time. So um, that, is a, that is an example of, of structural mapping. So as I, as I previously showed you, um, you can actually measure the structure of the brain, how it changes. So we can see here the example of this type of mapping. So uh, the scientists actually found several uh, several regions where where the brain changes. The again the white matter density increased uh, in the students. And what was interesting is that the actually the the grade that students achieved was was moderately related to to this actual. Um, density uh, to this number of uh, say nerve cells how they were packed in a in the brain so the the more the nerve cells there were the higher grades the students achieved um, and and that that was explained as uh, as caused by by the act of learning language and uh, w what I'm particularly interested in is is Mandarin and Mandarin was used in, in the previous study, however, it was used um, as a well. It could be used as any language could be used there because they didn't focus on on tones in particular. But what my study involves is um, perception and production of tones. As you probably know, Mandarin uses different tones to distinguish between the meanings of words. So I d I don't know if I can play the sounds here. If not, c can I have someone to produce four Mandarin tones here? There you go. So these are four different tones, and um, when you say a word with with 
each of these tones, the 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 meaning of the word can change. So again, what was found is that this um, processing of of these sounds of tones uh, can be observed in in the brain stem, in in this part of the brain. Oh, by the way, I, I should have mentioned that that's that's actually the the explanation of the tone. So here you have time, and here you have um, the frequency of sound. So how the that's the shape of of the the actual tones. So again, tones are processed uh, initially in the brainstem, which is this part of the brain, which is uh, evolutionary old, and brainstem is is considered first station in the auditory pathway. So when when humans perceive sounds, usually um, well, the first part of the brain that receives the sounds is brainstem. And what is particularly interesting is that brainstem is very sensitive to, to pitch, to tones. And when you observe brainstem, you can actually see that, that you can extract the shape of tones from the activity of brainstem. So what you can see on this, on this slide is the uh, is activity of the brainstem during during the perception of second tone of Mandarin. So, yi, was that correct? There you go. Uh, so, so that's what's happening. Uh, so, black line shows you the stimulus, the shape of the stimulus, and green line is the representation of, of this sound in native English speakers, and red line shows you representation of, of the sound in Chinese speakers. And as you can see here, and just on this part, is Chinese speakers are much uh, well are better in, in perceiving tones, and well they can distinguish them easier. But but what is interesting is that this this difference then is actually shown as well in the brainstem. So you can see that this part of brain actually is better in perceiving tones. But again, based on on this study, only it would be hard to say whether because of listening to tones, brainstem changes, or whether Chinese speakers or speakers of tonal languages, somehow they can speak languages because the brainstem is different. So um, other, other, other scientists conducted studies that shown that actually this activity can change as a function of training. So when people learn how to perceive tones, the brainstem changes as well. So the brainstem improves the, um, the perception, let's say the representation of of tones and and again but but that leads us to a question why the outcomes vary so drastically for for learners because not everyone can can perceive um, can can learn successfully foreign language again there are different explanations for that probably the the, the easiest would be um, lack of motivation or, or lack of time or, or incorrect input however there are some um, Markers, some particular traits in in brains of people who who are successful, uh, who are equal, who are bilinguals that know the languages in, in at the same level, and others who do not know them. So, this particular study, she compared the brains of um, of balanced and unbalanced bilinguals. So, people who could know two languages, English and Chinese, to the same level. These are balanced bilinguals and unbalanced bilinguals who, who could know only one language, uh, who knew one language better than, than the other. And what was found in this study uh, was that there, there were particular areas in the brain that actually uh, show different activity of the brain. So that's, that's part of the functional mapping that I mentioned previously. So, so that shows you that, that the brain not only changes the structure, but actually reacts different to, to certain, um, to certain um, tasks, because in this case they studied uh, phonologi phonological working memory, so how, how, how people could remember certain uh, sounds. And again, what causes difficulties in, in learning a foreign language? It, it is a very difficult, very difficult question, be because as I mentioned, there are, there are many complicated ways that, that you can understand, uh, that, that you can actually answer this question, depending on how you define language, how you define knowing a language. And again, probably the, mo the most, the simplest question, uh, the simplest answer is inappropriate input. 
So you can think that people just don't learn enough or they are not immersed in, in a specific environment where they are, um, they, they are actually forced to use the language all the time. That's the simplest reason. Um, however, as you can see, there is also something in the brain. However, it is still not clear whether what is going on precisely over there. The level of complexity is pretty high. Um, sorry, I can't give you any clear answers. Another explanation is, is genetic predisposition. However, this is fairly rare. So uh, certain genetic predisposition occurs in 2 to 5% of, of population. And the most famous case was uh, known as KE family, which had a particular language disorder. So this, part, this family had problems with uh, suffixes, which with, with creating words, and their speech was very difficult to understand as well. So what scientists started to do is actually tracing the, the genes that were responsible for, for this particular, um, for this particular um, problem in language. And what was found is that it's called now Fox P2 gene, which is known as, as the language gene. Um, but again, it is not very clear how, how, it, how it works because it can be shown it can it can influence the language production and processing on many levels so again there there are still many things to discover there but that is what is known so far briefly uh, so what is in what's in it for me what what makes what ma what what does multilingualism do to your brain so one of the best known uh, advantages of of being bio multilingual is um delay of of the onset of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So what was found in, in this particular study was that uh, bi or multilingual people actually had uh, the onset of dementia delayed by four and a half years. So the first sign of dementia were later in, in people who knew two or more languages by four and a half years compar when comparing to uh, mul monolinguals. And this particular study showed that the number of languages did not improve the did not increase the, the 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 onset of dementia so it didn't really matter whether you knew two languages or five languages and however it, it is still controversial so normally what happens in 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 alzheimer's disease is that brain uh, let's say brain shrinks and and again it seems like knowing several languages two or more languages uh, can slow down this process probably because people who know who know can speak several languages have to constantly switch between the languages so it can be understood as uh, as a form of mental exercise which keeps the brain healthy so in summary what i want you to take from this talk is and it is complicated sorry uh uh i hope i hope i, I made it a bit clearer but there is not there's nothing like one language center in the brain there's not nothing like one part of the brain that is responsible for language learning for language understanding um, some time ago it was most um, well a lot of scientists believe that there's there are regions that are, have certain functions and that they are specialized however now it, there's more in, there's more focus on the connectivity between between different parts of the brain so again, it, it it makes it makes studying the, this this particular topic much more, um, well, complicated as I said because we de we are dealing with the most complicated organ, the brain, and the most complicated human function, the language. And if you multiply that by several uh, times in in polyglots, then then the level of complexity increases. What we know now is that learning languages creates changes in in brain structure and functioning. So your brain will, will actually look different and function different than brains of people who don't, uh, who don't speak that many languages. And another thing that's, that's known is that learning languages, several languages within the range of average person's ability. So you don't need any particular um, intellectual skills because there are many societies where, where this number of languages is regularly spoken. However, in, in the Western world, it's, it's still considered relatively rare because, um, because usually the environment does not allow using, using that many languages. So I would like to end up with, uh, with just this. Uh, just keep calm and study languages.
keep your brain healthy. Thank you. You mentioned that we have no clear picture of causation and direction that it goes in. Uh, no, no, no. We, we, we can just based on, on one study. I say. Oh, I see. So, so then you have to actually run training studies to see um, whether particular um, occurrence changes the brain. Whether that's the cause, like like in the training studies. Because when you observe the brain, you can just say that these thing, two things co-occur at the same time, right? They occur at the same time, but you don't know whether the brain is different because because you know it's exactly as a result of, is that the cause. So so in some instances, like like the ones that I mentioned, you can actually tell that that that's the, the cause, right? So again, it depends it depends on the, on your case. If I'm well informed. Uh, early learned languages like mother tongue and languages you learn later are not using the same part of the brain and the same structures. Could you s tell something about that and about what happens when you learn several languages? Does every language have its own structure? What can you tell us about that? It is a tricky question. I I, uh, I especially avoided that because because uh, <laughs> uh, I thought that you, you can ask that. But there are some studies that show that that actually you can have that two languages in mostly bilingual in bilinguals because um, obviously it's easier to to study just two languages than than three. So uh, some studies show that that two languages uh, let's say activate the same brain area, whereas others show that that. Uh, some studies show that, that two languages activate the same area, others that they activate two different areas. But again, you can go deeper and, and into that and see what languages are they, right? Because it's more likely that when languages share, say, phonology or grammar, like, say, Spanish or and, and Catalan, they're, they're, they will be closer to each other because they use se si similar, uh, say, grammar, similar sounds. But is there a difference in the process of learning a mother tongue and learning later a language as an adult? Whether whether it's a, it's a different process to learn the first language and, and learn yes it, it it is a different because say infants let's say soak a language so they uh, pretty much infants are born with a skill to distinguish all the sounds in the world however after a certain time they 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 their cap capacity shrinks and they let's say are fixed on certain sounds exactly exactly they, they become focused. Let's say they, 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 there can be some movement, some improvements there, but, but um, let's say it, it, it changes. So it's much easier to learn a language uh, as, a, as, a, as an infant than, than later on. However, it doesn't mean that it, it is impossible to learn language later, later on in, in, in life. Um, when we say that, or when you say that um, we lose the capacity to learn languages as we get older, or something like that, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what exactly is it that is changing in the brain? What are we losing or what 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 is preventing us from being able to learn as well as children? It's not that we're losing the capacity to learn a language, really. It just becomes more difficult. So let's say it, it is easier to learn several languages when you're exposed to them um, as a kid. Because, as I said, after a certain time, you, your brain stops being so um, flexible exactly so so um, it, it is becoming a bit more more difficult but why it is happening I, I can't answer this question um, so I have uh, one question and then I have a, a spot of hope uh, from a personal story that I would like to share with you about the uh, brain and plasticity uh, so the first question, uh, or, or the question is, um, are there any studies that have been done with uh, when dementia has started, like the onset of dementia has already happened, and then they start learning a language? Could we just send everyone language books and just help them? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great solution? Have there been any studies done on that? Not that I'm aware of. 
Mm -hmm. However, I think it, it could be quite difficult because, as you said, when actually dementia starts, you already have this cognitive decline, yeah. decline in, in, in the intellectual function, so it could be difficult. But what, what, we know, what, we know that, oh, what we know now is that um, learning languages can delay this process, but, but whether learning languages, uh, when someone already has some signs of dementia, whether that changes uh, the, the onset of order. The, Results are, I'm, not, I'm not sure, that's not my field, so I don't want to give any misleading information. Um, and uh, you also said that uh, it might be harder for adults to learn because the brain isn't as flexible. So the plasticity, uh, as we have observed it in adults, is less than for children. And uh, there's one uh, personal story, and that's uh, my boyfriend. He was in his mid-twenties, and he was in uh, a car accident and he had injuries to his brain. There were five parts where there um, was blood. I don't know exactly, hematoma, I think, uh, the name in English. And the doctors, everyone told him, you will never be able to learn like advanced things again, and you will never be able to program again. You will never be able to code. And he, you, he had his own company, he had coded different uh, new databases, and uh, all his uh, all his uh, customers were like saying, "Okay, he's in a coma right now, but we will wait until he wakes up because he's the best." And he came back, and um, instead of doing as the doctors told him to just take it easy, relax, let your brain, you know, don't um, exaggerate or don't try to overwhelm your brain with something new. Instead, he said, "I want to continue learning. I want to to be able to program again," and. Um, Contradicting the doctors, he programs, he has his company built up again, and everything's successful. So uh, the standard of knowledge that the doctors have today uh, might not be the same as the science it uh, is at this moment right now. So if anyone else has something similar, just continue working, you know? And it will work out, you can overcome anything. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, okay. I've got a question based on um, a news story that was out in the UK about a year or two ago. And it was an older gentleman who had been evacuated to Wales during the war. And he lived in a Welsh speaking community, heard the language, but never learned it actively. He had a stroke years and years later. This is like a couple of years ago. And when he started recovering, he spoke Welsh <laughs> and had to sort of get back into English again. But the Welsh has stayed. I just wanted to know, how the hell does that work? <laughs> so, so, so in this case, you, you can, I guess, so I, don't know, I don't know the particular case, but, but my assumption is that in this case, my, it seems like the, the part of the brain that was controlling Welsh was somehow spared. So that that might be the explanation. However, I, I'm not precisely sure how how that works in in this in this case because, as as I mentioned, as I wanted wanted you to understand, is that there are so many different ways that languages can actually um, be, let's say, processed in in, in person's brain. That, that it, there, there is not really simple answer to that. So in one person, it can be spared, say, a second language. In others, they might lose them all. In in some other people who have um, strokes, you can. Uh, something called uh, foreign language syndrome can occur when, where y after a stroke you, you sound as if you were foreign, although say you, can o you only can speak one language. So, so there, there are many different things that can happen after strokes because it, it um, influences all accidents because they, they influence different parts of brain and, and uh, it, it language is complicated. <laughs> yeah. It was particularly an intriguing case when I read it because he claimed he'd never spoken Welsh and he wasn't even aware that he knew it, which was just sounded extraordinary to me. So it just shows just how weird our brains are, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else? Oh. Now, on, uh, regarding the uh, question from Richard, what's your opinion on glossolalia? You've heard the word? It's a Greek term meaning that somebody who never knew a language just out of the blue just starts sing, speaking in that language. 
A famous example is Philip K. Dick. He, ex he sort of experimented with LSD. <laughs> All right. So he took about a. Yes, okay, that's, that's very uh, modest. And he took about a gram of it, and then for the next three hours, he spoke in perfect ancient Greek, and then in Latin. And his wife recorded the experience, said he never knew those languages. So based on your, um, the sketch there with the area 45, 45, 44, those areas producing the languages, could they be like um, sort of a, a CPU of the brain? And when we were born, our parents just programming the language we're gonna speak, so we are, capable of actually speaking all the languages ever spoken, but because our parents speak, I don't know, Greek or French or Spanish, the CPU just says, okay, now the coding will be this language. We have the capacity to speak all the languages in the world to learn them because people speak different languages, but, but you actually need, need some input to, to know them. So, so the idea that, that someone suddenly uh, starts speaking languages that they never heard or, or studied before sounds very uh, iffy to me, to be honest. So I don't know this particular case, but sounds to me very uh, strange. Okay, I, I, yeah, I have to dig deeper into that. But no. Right, I have m less complicated question, but still complicated. I I heard about uh, some talks uh, that uh, the language you speak influences the way you think. That how can you comment on that? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is a it's a very long uh, say story. It's called. Um, well, Worfen, Worfen, Sapirov, exactly, Sapirov uh, hypothesis. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in. Well, I don't know enough about it, so I prefer to avoid the topic. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? How much of our brain do we use when we write, uh, and don't speak actually, but, but just write? W well. It again, <laughs> it's hard to say because what do you mean by use, using uh, using using brain, right? Well, I suppose when you when you uh, speak, you use the part of your brain that uh, directs your mouth. If you use your hand instead to write, do you then still use the part that div uh, that uh, regulates your mouth while you are uh, writing? You can't say that you just use this particular part of brain because when you write, you have to also breathe, you have to look, you have to. So all the other parts of of brain also have to do that, control your body temperature. So you can't say that you only have one part of the brain doing one thing at that time. So uh, exactly, you can't you can't do that. So it, it it is a it is a tricky thing, uh, and I can't see really way to estimate that at this moment, really. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, like having read a number of uh, papers on this, like whether we can actually relate the scans from functional imaging techniques to any actual physical changes in the brain, because it seems like most of these techniques are just focused on observing activity or relaxation. And I'm like wondering, like, and again, as you say, like uh, there's a lot of factors involved in language production and uh, comprehension, whether we're actually perhaps overstating the scope of what these techniques can achieve. I think that they are very useful and they they are actually um, complementary. So so you can you can study some uh, phenomena in using both techniques to so observe activity and um, and and structural changes as well. And that gives you f say broader picture, broader understanding. So 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 it it is useful, but but you can't really focus on one thing because there's always something else that that exactly on just just one part of the brain or one uh, say function or, or area because it it, it is uh, let's say spread throughout different uh, things so so it, it 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 is very helpful however it's not that uh, easy to to study your wife mentioned the critical period for learning like children i said i said it's good I, I said it's contentious, so it's uh, again uh, it, it is a it, it it could be another talk uh, about the critical period so yeah Yeah, I recently read an article about uh, how languages can affect your personality. And I know that many people, they speak different languages, and when they speak in this language, they behave or use different words that don't sound like them in their mother tongue. So I was wondering, you have some information about how this uh, learning a new language uh, affects your personality, or something like that. What's going on in the brain? I heard a lot of anecdotes about that as well, uh, but I don't recall any 
study that would actually control all the factors involved. So, uh, yeah, based on anecdotes, it seems like it's possible, but uh, based on hard data, I don't know. I was curious what other skills uh, use the same parts of the brain as language learning? Like, in particular, maybe I have the feeling that maybe music would use similar parts, but I'm not sure, and I was curious. Yeah, because some some actions that you use in in language are common with with other things. So, for example, you can when you when you speak, you actually have to control your your muscles, your jaw muscles, and you you do the same type same thing when you when you when you yawn, for example, right? Or, or when you when you write, you well, okay, that's language example, high level. Well, it it, it is pretty complicated. Uh, motor skills are pretty complicated, but in, in high levels. Well, it, it, it's not it's not just one area that does just one thing. So when you look at the studies involved using functional imaging, you would see that um, the, uh, these are not areas that are activated or used just in in one particular functions. So they are used in in many other things. So so that that's uh, that that this activity is, is spread throughout, really. Yeah, it, it, it is, it is, it is, yeah. That, that that's something I, w I wanted to take fr from that. That it's not just one part of the brain that that you that's used just for one thing. That just specialized and never uh, is never used for anything else. But but it, it, it's a it's a connection. It's a network. So uh, it's more like that. I'm I'm just really curious when you say that uh, part of the brain lights up or it shows activity. What what is activity in the brain? What what does that look like? What is that? Well, again, it depends on the methods you use. So there there are well several. I I don't remember if you <laughs> there there was a slide when I show you just various methods used. So so some of the um, yeah there you go. So so for example in in this case it's just electrical activity. So when you ha when when neurons are let's say send the signals they they create. Uh, electrical activity and you can you can actually measure that activity from top of the scalp you can also measure this activity based on on single neurons but again in complicated functions like like language it wouldn't tell us much uh, so so in that could be activity in in other cases we use direct um, uh, measures like like this uh, it's called bolts so or blood oxygenation uh, level um, measure which which shows you that where which which part of the brain um, actually uses where the oxygenated blood is and based on that um, the we can assume that that's that part of the brain is used in particular task so again these are different types of uh, of activity so it, it's not a direct way to to measure that we just use uh, indirect ways of of, of of assess the functions uh, and uh, there are several ways to to do it so that that's these are ones. There are others where that use uh, um, infrared spectroscopy, so that that measure um, again blood flow using uh, using light to see where where blood flows in which part of the brain. And again, based on that, you can you can see um, you can assume that where brain flows more active something is going on. But but again, it is it is a very good question. Uh, what what does this activity mean? Because again, you can you can look at it from from different perspectives using different methods. So yeah, it, it, it's uh okay. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. So yeah. So sorry. Uh, I said that I will finish at six. Okay. You're late.